Ladies and gentlemen, this is Ralph Brown from Zurich in Switzerland with part four of the educational podcast on dermoscopy called Structures with Histopathological Correlations. In this podcast, we will go on to cover the histopathological correlation of the criteria for basal cell carcinoma, seborrheic keratosis, angioma, angiokeratoma, and very briefly, the blood vessels. In basal cell carcinomas, we see leaf-like areas. These are brown to gray-blue discrete bulbous blobs forming a leaf-like pattern, reminding the shapes of finger pads. If there is no pigment network, this is very suggestive of a pigmented BCC. Picture of a pigmented basal cell carcinoma clinically. Dermoscopically, we see center, ulceration, arborizing telangiectasia, but at the periphery, these large leaf-like areas, blue in color, sharply demarcated, corresponding to pigmented tumor nests. Again, at higher power, these leaf-like blue-gray areas. Histopathologically, one can see these pigmented tumor nests explaining very nicely this leaf-like pattern. Large blue-gray ovoid nests are large and well circumscribed, confluent, pigmented ovoid areas. They're usually larger than globules, not intimately connected to the tumor body. And if again, if there's no argument for a melanocytic lesion, this is very suggestive for a basal cell carcinoma. Basal cell carcinoma on the forehead, clinically, dermoscopically, we see in the right lower part a large, well demarcated, blue-gray ovoid nest. No pigment network, no argument for melanocytic lesion. This is very suggestive for pigmented basal cell carcinoma. Here the histopathological correlation showing that very big and large pigmented tumor nest corresponding to what we've seen before. Spoke wheel like structures are well circumscribed brown to gray-blue-brown, gray, they are radial projections that meet at the darker brown central hub. And again, if there is no argument for a melanocytic lesion, for example, aggregated globules or pigment network, this criterion is very suggestive of a pigmented basal cell carcinoma. Here you have a pigmented basal cell carcinoma in a skin type 4 patient, and you see these spoke wheel like structures throughout the entire lesion. You see some degree of ulceration, but what you mainly see are these spoke wheel like structures, so the dark center, central hub, with the radial brownish projections towards the periphery. Another case, courtesy of Dr. Rabinovitz, again you have these dark hubs and the radial brown projections towards the periphery, spoke wheel like areas. Histopathologically, you see the center of the lesion, and if you take a higher power, you see the basal cell carcinoma that spreads from the center towards the periphery. And if you look from the top, it explains very nicely the aspect of the spoke wheel areas. Sometimes this is very subtle. You see a very superficial and very early case of pigmented basal cell carcinoma, clinically in the left upper corner and the dermoscopy on the right side, where you have again the dark centers resembling globules, but around it, if you look very precisely, you have these light brown radial projections. Let's move on to the criteria of seborrheic keratosis, mainly Miller-like cysts and comedo-like openings. Miller-like cysts are round, whitish or yellowish structures, mainly seen in seborrheic keratosis. Sometimes, if they're small in size, they can be seen in congenital nevi. If they're pigmented, they resemble globules. Histopathologically, they correspond to intraepidermal keratin-filled cysts. Comedo-like openings are mainly seen as well in seborrheic keratosis, sometimes in papillomatous melanocytic nevi. They correspond to keratin-filled invaginations of the epidermis. This is a clinical picture of pigmented seborrheic keratosis. Already clinically, you could see the pseudocomedones and, and the pseudohorn cysts. So, what you see, the whitish 
structures are the milia-like cysts of different size and you have the brownish structures that are open to the surface and they correspond to these keratin-filled invaginations, the pseudocomedons. Again, you have the keratin-filled invaginations, pseudocomedons, and you have the milia-like cysts more on the right side. Angioma, angiokeratoma, they are red, blue, black globules or lacunas of red, bluish to red, black color. They are, have homogeneous areas and are sharply demarcated. This is a typical clinical picture of cherry angioma, dermoscopic view, these homogeneous, large, sharply demarcated globules, very typical for vascular lesions. Sometimes it's not as easy because these vascular lesions could have a thrombosis, a partial thrombosis, and congealed blood has the blackest of the black color that you could get. So congealed blood in an angioma appears to be black, a really a deep dark black. So this was what happened here. You see this thrombosed, partially thrombosed angioma clinically, dermoscopically. On the right side you see the congealed blood, so no structures discernible. And on the left side you see, still see the reddish, blue, violet globules, lacunes in these partially thrombosed angioma. We're going to have a separate podcast on that, but let's just mention the vascular architecture. So there are different blood vessels that have been described recently and they are specific for a specific diagnosis. So you have the red lagoons, they are more mainly found in vascular lesions. You have the hairpin vessels, they can be typical or atypical. Typical hairpin vessels you find them in seborrheic keratosis or keratinizing tumors. Atypical uh, hairpin vessels you can find them in thick melanomas and spitz nevi. You have irregular polymorphous vessels, usually you find them in melanoma. Dotted vessels, they are small vessels resembling head of a pin. You could see them as well in Spitz nevi or melanoma, but as well in benign lesions such as psoriasis or squamous cell carcinoma. You have comma-like vessels resembling the shape of a comma, and you find them in compound or dermal nevi. You can have clusters of glomerular vessels. These are small and fine coiled vessels, as seen in 25% of Bowen's disease. You have string of pearls, globular vessels, following a serpiginous distribution. And this is very pathognomonic for clear cell acanthoma. You have crown vessels. Ground vessels are vessels that come from the periphery towards the center of a lesion. They are not as sharply demarcated as arborizing tail angiectasia and basal cell carcinoma. So they are a little out of focus. And you have these yellowish structures at the center correlating to the uh, hypertrophic sebaceous glands. So and you find them in sebaceous gland hyperplasia. You have as well corkscrew vessels. These are irregular, thick, coiled vessels. You find them in melanoma or melanoma metastases. And last but not least, the arborizing telangiectasia, the arborizing vessels resembling the branches of a tree. And you find them in basal cell carcinoma. So why are blood vessels so important? So if they are so important, why haven't we paid attention to them before? And to explain you this, we show the clinical picture of this melanoma, 2.3 millimeter melanoma on the left side, and the big dermoscopy picture. So what you see is that the clinical picture is, appears much redder, the nodular part, than in the dermoscopy picture. And why is that? You see blood vessels in the dermoscopy picture, but since we used so much pressure to have a good immersion in these lesions, so we erased all the blood vessels with our pressure. On the left side, you see the nodular part with contact dermoscopy, so you have lots of pressure on it. And on the right side, it's the same lesion, but with polarized light dermoscopy without any contact. And there you see very nicely the atypical blood vessels. So this explains why during a long time we have not, we've seen vessels, but since they have not been so visible, we never paid attention to them. And it's only with the polarized light scopes that we started paying more attention to them. Let me close with a few general remarks on histology and pigmented lesions. What happens with the diagnosis of pigmented lesions? So we have the benign lesions like the junctional nevus on the left side, the malignant lesion like the melanoma on the right side, 
and we have something in between which we call the atypical or dysplastic nevi. So it's somewhere in the middle between them. White meaning benign, black meaning malignant, but as you can see there's a spectrum between black and white starting from the light gray going to the gray to the dark gray to the black. So and the atypical ones are exactly in the black in the, in the gray zone. This is reality. This is what we see. Now, what does histopathology? Histopathology tries to put the reality that we all know from our clinic practice into four different boxes. So you have the benign lesions, white. You have the low-grade dysplastic nevi, they're in the gray zone, but in the light grade. Then you have the high-grade dysplastic nevi, they're closer towards the melanoma, so in the dark gray range, and you have the melanomas in the black range. Let's start with these four boxes because depending on your pathologist and depending the school he went through, they're going to read out these diagnoses, this histopathologic reality, in different ways. Some pathologists will read benign versus malignant. So they are benign lesions and melanoma. And as benign lesions, they count the benign, the low-grade dysplastic, and the high-grade dysplastic nevi. And as melanoma, they call it in situ, invasive, just this they call melanoma. So they never read out lesions as dysplastic nevus. There are some pathologists that read them out in the following way. They read them out as benign, meaning white. All the dysplastic lesions, doesn't matter low-grade or high-grade, they put them in the gray zone, they read them out as dysplastic, and they have the group of melanoma. So they have three groups. And there are some pathologists that do it even in a different way. They read them out as benign, so they put the benign and the low-grade dysplastic in one category. They call dysplastic only the high-grade dysplastic, so the dark gray lesions, and they call the malignant lesions melanoma. As a conclusion, in this fourth part of the podcast, we've been looking at the different histopathological criteria that we see in dermoscopy and their histopathological correlation. As an addendum, there's going to be an additional podcast on that as well. Since blood vessels have gained so much importance and since the structures are important, the analysis of a lesion, the approach, is done in a two-step algorithm that you can see here already, but which is addressed in a different podcast series. Thank you very much for your attention. and I